Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to a new episode of Psycho's Platters, episode 129, 45 Finds Part Dorsal L2. Uh, I hope everybody has had themselves a good week. Um, believe it or not, I just shot this one a couple days after part one. And I have a slight fib to tell you that I did not intend. Uh, there's going to be a part three on the 45 find. Sorry, I I didn't realize until I started looking and I'm going, oh, here's some things I forgot to tell you guys about from the same store, but just a little bit beforehand. So let's get let's get to uh, let's get to part two, uh, if so may. Uh, another batch of ten goodies. Yes, ten goodies. We start off with. I wrote everything down this time because there is just a lot of information. And by the way, thank you guys for the positive responses that you've gone off and mentioned about how I try to heavily research things. You know what? Like I said, and I'm not knocking the viewers out there because all of you people in the BC, wonderful channels. I, seriously, every one of them that I'm subscribed to and I watch, I watch maybe, I'm going to confess, about 25% of the output. Uh, that you guys do every week. I try to do the best I can. Um, but fantastic. Seriously. But I like to go off and I like to try to research the stuff that I show. The best I can with the sources that I've got. Some of it's from the noggin. Other, other computer sources are obviously the rest of it. So we start off here. Now the condition on these suckers, they like they're just like the original first batch from part one. They need some cleaning. They've been gently used. How about that? Uh, I would say a toss-up around um, GB, G plus to about VG plus. That's what we're looking at here, okay? So, June of 1961 on the satellite label, last night from the Marquis. That's right. I love this label. This is the first time I've ever seen this, and I know a lot of people are going to go, oh, well, I've seen this before. Um, but like I said, it came out in June of 61, made it to number three on the pop charts, and number two on the R&B charts. Uh, the LP uh, that this ended up off of, of course, also called Last Night, was the first album released on the Stax label. Uh, it was co-written, uh, the song, by famed producer Chips Moman. I don't know if that name sounds familiar to you. Um, he had Elvis involvement uh, in, the, in, you know, in the future. He ended up... Um, in the mid 80s he cut an album that's still unreleased from Ringo uh, but he was in the Nashville scene uh, and the Memphis scene so I mean he's he's been there um, when he produced this song he didn't want a guitar on the instrumental so he turns to Steve Cropper yeah he's on the session you know future Booker T and the MGs uh, and Blues Brothers band uh, he turns to Steve and says, okay, look, I don't want a guitar on this session, so instead I want you to play the hold down note, the hold down on the organ of the root note. You musicians out there are going to get that. I'm sorry, I'm just reading this off of a source. So that's Cropper's contribution, is he holds down the organ note of, of the root note of this session. So I thought kind of cool, kind of weird, Marquis last night. Then we go to Lollipop from Ronald and Ruby on RCA. In February 1958, this came out. Uh, the song was written by Julius Dixon and Beverly Ross, a.k.a. Ruby. Uh, now, they used Ronald Gum. He was a 13-year-old neighbor of Dixon's at the time. And so they became Ronald and Ruby, which are actually an interracial performance duo at the time. Um... The song was actually inspired by Dixon uh, because he was late to a songwriting session with Ross uh, because his daughter had a lollipop stuck in her hair. True story. This version made it to number 20. This is the same song that a year later in 59 that the Cordettes would end up doing their good old lollipop, 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 Yeah, you know the rest. If, have you, go listen to this on YouTube, because this is actually a very cool little version of this thing from 58 from Ronald and Ruby. Um, next thing I got going here, <clears throat> on the Herald label, from 1960, 
Maurice Williams and the Zodiac Stay. Now, this particular one, even though it was released in 60, was actually written by Maurice back in 53 at age 15. Um, he was trying to convince his date at the time to stay past her 10 p.m. curfew. Yeah, Maurice lost, but guess what? I guess we won, didn't we? Because he ends up writing this song. Um, what happened is, is that it was put on a demo in 60, uh, but they went to all the record companies, and all of them passed, except for Al Silver from Herald Records. He goes off, he hears it, he likes it, he goes, two things, though, about this particular song. You're going to have to recut it. Number one, on the original demo, the levels were pretty low, so they were kind of quiet and, you know, hard to hear. The second thing is, there was an original line of Let's Have Another Smoke was in the song originally. They had to take that out if they wanted to have airplay. It, uh, it did reach number one in November of 60. Uh, it was also the shortest single to reach number one on the Billboard charts, minute 36 seconds. By 1990, this song sold over 8 million copies, partially because of the, of the reintroduced interest, because this was on the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. 8 million copies. I'm, I'm glad to have that in the collection. Um, this one here, The Showman, It Will Stand, on Minute Label, 1961. It, the Minute label was based out of New Orleans. This way made it to 61 on the charts, but the band was actually from Norfolk, Virginia. In 61 and 62, after this was put out, they would cut about 15 more tunes under the tutelage <laughs> of barely known Alan Toussaint, which, of course, he passed away, if I remember correctly, earlier this year. Uh, and then... Fast forward to 1968, the lead singer of The Showman, General Norman Johnson. Does that name sound familiar to you by chance? It actually did to me as soon as I saw that because when he left the band in 1968, he ended up being involved in Inviticus Records, but also ended up being the lead singer of a band called Chairman of the Board. Remember? Give me just a little more time. I can't sing. But that's why. So he went from showman to that. Pretty fancy, if I say so myself. This one here, real cool. I, I showed you in the last episode a early 70s Elvis. Now I'm going to show you an early 60s Elvis. One of my favorite 60s Elvis tunes, Little Sister. I, little Sister just, just cranks. I like this version. I even like Rock Pile's version with Robert Plant from the Concert of Campuchia. That's actually that's a, oops, sorry. That's actually the first version I actually heard was that one. Sorry about nudging that there. That was the first version, and then I found out this was an Elvis cover. that found the 45 originally, and I'm like, God, this rocks, and it does. Lead guitar, powered by coffee, lead guitar by Hank Garland, uh, and, of course, Jordan Ayer's back in Elvis up on this particular one. This is a double A side, though, too, because the flip on here, Marie's the name of my latest flame, also got itself in the top of the charts, too. So, very good on that one from 61, uh, August of 61, actually. The next one here, never saw this one before, either, on Blaze Records, Bobby Comstock and the Counts doing their version of Patty Page's Tennessee Waltz. Now, this was made in late 1959. They were formed in 58 from New York. That's where they're from. This made it to 52 on the charts and appeared, and they, the band appeared on a few Alan Freed package shows and American Bandstand. Uh, in the late 60s, Bobby Comstock formed a band called Zebra, that cuts the material for Phillips Records. And then uh, around 69 to, I want to say, 72, 73, uh, he cut a few 45s on Bell as Comstock LTD Limited. So uh, pretty cool to have that in the collection, too. Next one, don't really have a lot of information on this, but 
this was the one of the oddballs in the bunch. May of 1960, Ricky Nelson, it's a it's an England pressing on London of of Young Emotions and Right by Your Side. I went and played this really quick on YouTube while I was researching this. Young Emotions um, kind of sounds something like a um, Frankie Avalon, Bobby Rydell type number, okay? The one that's really cool on here that I like is Right By My Side. That's the one that should have been a hit. But that was the B. They should have flipped it over. I think he would have had a bigger hit with this. But it was really cool to find this original UK pressing of Ricky. I... I won't pass up any Ricky Nelson. I think I've told you guys this, and I'm especially not going to pass up original English pressing of, uh, of Ricky as well. This next one here, excuse me, from 1960 on Shad Records, the Bowmarks Clap Your Hands. I Cool label, first of all. I never heard of the Bowmarks, so I had to look this up a little bit. They were a Canadian rock group, actually, originally called the Deltones, but they changed their name in 62, the Bow Marks, as a nod to the Bow Mark Missile at the time. Go figure, right? How many, how many people named their band after a missile? This was a top 50 hit also in America. They did put in a bandstand appearance, but they broke up in 1963. So I thought that was kind of cool. We're almost done, kids. This one here, you know what? I have been a Bill Haley fan since I was a little kid. Seriously. I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, I know people asked me what my first 45s were. And uh, I know I went off and I mentioned in the past that I remember getting some Paul Revere and the Raiders, Monkeys, Dave Clark 5. Well, Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock was one of them too. I, I barely remember that. That's not what this is. But I'll tell you this. When I find late 50s, Bill Haley, like this skinny mini right here, I ain't going to pass this up for a quarter either. Skinny mini, 1958, it was a top 25 hit. This I thought was kind of cool. In 66, alright, so you're talking mid-1960s Bill Haley and the Comets. He was popular in Mexico and South America. Um, I'm not entirely sure, so I don't want to speak out of turn here. But if I remember correctly, the reason why he toured down there and performed down there, um, on YouTube, for example, I saw a mid-60s t Mexican TV show appearance. It was it was the Bill Haley and the Comets with uh, Big Joe Turner. That's who they were backing was Big Joe Turner. Go look that one up because that's a cool clip. But I'm led to believe that um, it was tax troubles in the, here in the U.S. as to why he moved to Mexico for a while. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm wrong. Somebody quote in the comments on this. But I could have sworn that I remember hearing about this. So when Skinny Minnie got recut in 1966, the single down uh, it was in on Odeon Records in Mexico, it was called La Flaca Mini, <laughs> right? And there was, it was part English, part Spanish version. The Spanish lyrics were sung by Bill's wife. And uh, on the 66 version, comparing the 58 to the 66 version, the only members that were on both was Bill Haley and, and the sax man Rudy Pompanelli. Hope I'm getting that right. Who unfortunately passed away in '76, but so I'm glad to have this in the collection. That was one of the things that Doug found. Um, he found a '59 Bill Haley on Decca. Really cool. I, one I never even heard of before. I know they're not worth a heck of a lot, but it's fun trying to find this stuff. Then I end up with with the last record on this part here. It's a mystery record. It's a mystery record to me anyway, all right? <clears throat> the Casuals, the A-side features a guy by the name of Rick Towson. The B-side has Casuals with Linda Burke. This is on the Nashville Records label. 
the only hint that I've got, and I had to go through four sources on this, it, it does say on the label, a division of Starday Records. Starday Records, of course, has been around since the late 20s, early 30s. But they didn't, it, it's a teen rocker uh, for the Rick Towson side, and then there's a, it's a ballad for Linda uh, on the Linda side. The only hints that I've got on this, and if anybody knows about this, also mention in the comments, please. The Nashville Records subsidiary of Starday got started in 1964. This 45, I even tried looking under a numbering system, and the closest thing I could get was an LP numbering system, which that wasn't helping. So my best guess, this could be anywhere from 64 to late 67, because I'm led to believe that the 45s that came out from 68 on would have said a division of Star Day hyphen King because they bought the King Records catalog in 68. I looked this up on 45cat.com Discogs um, Music Shack and I ended up with three responses on this thing just that they were for sale and that they, this 45 sold between 50 and $100. That's the range I've got on this. So, so far, this little unknown baby is really cool. Like I said, it's in, uh, it's in, uh, it, it, it's in, actually, I would say probably VG shape at least. But, uh, that's what you're looking at <laughs> for this one. Um, and that's pretty much it for part two of the 45s. Uh, two other finds I want to show you really, really quick. Um, when I got the 45s, this was for a dollar. And I don't know how that, there was like 10 copies of this. But it's from uh, the same people that do classic rock, Bowie, Bowie Starman. This is a very small magazine tribute. Maybe you guys have got this one. This is the back, this is the front. I only paid a dollar for this. It actually originally says for the U.S. thirteen ninety nine. this was listed uh, a lot of great pictures. Let me show you this one from the Thin White Duke period from the mid-70s. Um, just a wonderful magazine. I could not pass this up for a dollar. And Barnes & Noble had some clearance this time around. And so if I remember correctly, it was $4.99 I think I paid for this or $4.98 or whatever. But I finally got it. It's in soft cover, but that's okay. The Pete Townsend's Who I Am. I actually read this in a hardcover. I think it was through the library or something. But you know what? I mean, I think there's a slight update on this. This came out in 2012. I love The Who. I actually love Pete Townsend's solo work. At least the first couple albums. Okay, uh, uh, what is it? Rough, uh, oh, um, Empty Glass. I like that album. And uh, all, the, all the Best Cowboys Have Chinese Eyes. Those are like the two I probably really like. Um, Face to Face, is that what it's called? That album is all right, but you know, I, um, I keep hearing this weird rumor that that the Who, uh, Roger and Pete, um, actually cut a whole album of blues covers. I don't know how true that is. I, if that's the case, I'd like to hear them. Because even though I bought Endless Wire, the one from 2005 or 2006, I didn't really like it. I'm sorry. And I haven't liked any of the new Who material from that time frame on. I I'm, I don't know what happened. Um, I heard they're really good live, which is great. And I'd still love to see them. But I don't know. I, I hope he's got at least one or two good ones left in him. Because, you know, in my opinion anyway, uh, the Who... 68 to about 73 was like was like their period. They they could do no wrong, at least in my eyes, for those five years. It was like shortly after that, it's like the cracks started coming in, you know. But for those five years, I think that was their best damn period, seriously. You know, the Tommy, the Who's Next, and all those 45s that didn't get put on those albums, and the B-sides, it's fantastic stuff. All right, guys, I know I've been yapping a long time, so new subs literally in the last couple days from my last broadcast. So I'm really happy to announce Roop, I hope I'm pronouncing this, 
Roop, R-O-O-P-E, Jusala, <laughs> I'm probably butchering this, J-U-U-S-S-O-L-A, Jusala, uh, Cameron Zawina, Z-Y-W-I-N-A, Chris Hansen, Russ H, and, oh boy, A-E-K-A-S-T-A-R, Akastar, I'm, I'm probably really butchering this, Thank you all for subbing, even if I did butcher your name. Um, my goal, of course, on Psycho's Platter is to entertain and educate. And uh, I try to do it every every show for you guys. I love the VC. I really do. Um, quickly, shout-outs again. Wax Museum with Ronnie Dark, uh, 6 to 9 p.m. Central Standard on Sundays, followed by Night Owl Lounge with Mike Adams from 9 to 10 on Central Standard Time on Sunday nights. Go like them both on Facebook, uh, their pages. Uh, you can listen to their shows on Uber stations and tuned in, I'm told. Uh, and to tell you the truth, it's better than listening to the WVA VOA website, uh, 87.7 uh, in Syracuse, New York. That's what you would type in for, for that. Uh, also, let's see other radio shows. Freak Beat with Ken Worth. Uh, from 107.5 The Spy out of Tulsa. That's, uh, that's 8 to 9 p.m. on Monday nights. I'm going to throw a new one here for you, though, okay? I don't get Friday nights off very much, but Friday night from 7 to 8 p.m., Juke Joint Ginny, if you like old rockabilly, even newer stuff, too, she's got a hell of a show. Uh, she doesn't even know I'm shouting out this particular one, but also 107.5 The Spy, out of Tulsa, 7 to 8 p.m. Central Standard, Juke Joint Ginny and the Rockabilly and, and that early R&B fun, okay? Uh, let's see, uh, Thrifty Music Collectors Group, uh, Mike Bolia uh, remembers Alan Freed, if I remember correctly, 7 to 10 p.m. Central Standard Time. Mike, I hope I got that right. I'm going to have to re-research re that as well, so forgive me. Uh, this is Rock and Roll Radio. That's also on Westcott Radio on Sunday nights. All great shows. All great shows. Um, Shindig, the best damn English rock magazine out there. Uh, the YouTube vinyl community. Without the YouTube vinyl community, we would not all be here. By the way, before I end, end this broadcast, I have a new piece of information to tell you guys. My friend Doug Fields has got a show name. That's right. So very soon, he will be shooting his first episode of the Vinyl Grotto, G-R-O-T-T-O. -T -T -O. Please go like the Vinyl Grotto on Facebook. He does have a website he started, but please at least start liking the Facebook page. The first video will be an interview show. I'm not going to tell you who. I think it's going to be an interesting interview. Mm -hmm. So, The Vinyl Grotto with Doug Fields. It's going to be excellent. I am looking forward to watching this first show. All right, guys. Once again, thank you. I love you all, VC. This is how this works. You take care. God bless. Rock on and keep spinning them like there's no tomorrow, my friends. Have a good one. <laughs>